Hello everyone, good evening. Welcome to the Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Miriam and I'm one of your Ath Fellows for the school year. With the overturn of Roe v. Wade, press coverage on reproductive health care, especially abortion, greatly increased. From grassroots organizers to Congress members, people of all genders and ages have engaged in this very public debate about abortion. Today's abortion debate has brought up other topics, such as fertility treatments and abortion pills, which are currently being deba debated among state and federal policymakers. New technology and advances in science have shaped today's conversation on abortion. But throughout American history, both social and political events, such as increased immigration, the end of slavery, and the rise of Catholic organizations have shaped public perceptions of abortion. Tonight, we will hear from our very own Professor Lisa Cody about how abortion has transformed from a private secret to a public debate over time. Professor Cody is an associate professor in CNC's history department where she teaches courses on the human body, ra topics ranging from reproduction, gender, and violence across the Atlantic and Northern European worlds. With this focus, Professor Cody has analyzed the history of medicine, law, and film. She's an award-winning historian for her academic articles and her first monograph. Currently, Professor Cody's working on two book projects, Between the Sheets, Sex, Intimacy, and Conflict in 18th Century Marriage, and How Abortion Became an American Obsession. Professor Cody's also a fellow at the Royal Historical Society and the Royal Society of the Arts, both based in London. Professor Cody's Athenaeum presentation tonight is part of a larger series of talks on reproductive justice organized by the Gender and Sexuality Studies Department. She is the first speaker of this series, so please stay tuned for other talks from 5C professors who will talk about abortion from their respective fields. Before getting started, I wanted to remind everyone of two quick things. One, wearing your mask indoors while not actively eating or drinking is highly encouraged by the college. And two, please take this time right now to silence and put away your cell phones. And please remember that both video and audio recordings by the audience are strictly prohibited. Now please join me in welcoming Professor Cody. Miriam, that is so kind and um, rich with knowledge and thought. Thank you. I hope I can live up to your introduction. Um, so thank you all for being here. I'm really grateful to um, many colleagues and friends. I have to um, shout out one of my oldest friends from high school came um, uh, with her husband. And I have to also shout out my cousin Evie, who is um, one of our uh, most beloved um, staff members here at CMC. But mostly I want to thank all my students. Um, past and present, and now I sound like I'm giving a eulogy, but thank you, thank you, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Now, as um, my students know, I'm terrible at technology, so I'm sure I'm going to just mess this up, but bear with me. So I'm not going to end up doing clips. That ended up being too complicated with technology and stuff. So anyway, I do have some images for you. So. So I hit the arrows? Okay. Ah, okay. All right, okay. In 1916, when Where Are My Children came out, not only was abortion illegal in every single US state, so too was birth control banned in many states. Birth control, abortion, and premarital sex were risque topics for a mass audience. Publications describing contraception and birth control devices were considered, oh God, I'm on page two. Oh no. Oh dear. Well, that's what happens when you don't know the technology of a printer. Um, <laughs> so the questions that uh, this uh, movie raises are, is this movie an endorsement of birth control? Is it an endorsement of, so we see professional services here, abortion? Is it an endorsement of women getting to live their lives and do what they wish? Is it 
an endorsement of fetal life. So the critics loved this movie, but the question was, what was it about? So now I can go to page two. So Lois Weber's Where Are My Children was arguably the biggest movie of the year, talked about incessantly. The critics were unanimous in their praise, but the censors and advocates for contraception were divided about the film's arguments. As you can see from those four different pictures, it's a little unclear what Lois Weber was up to. So like the dozen or so other American birth control films during World War I, this film's topics of contraception and abortion divided the American public deeply. I'll return to Where Are My Children and other period abortion films later in this talk, but I start here to suggest that debate and division about women's rights over their reproductive bodies is substantially older than any of our lives in this room, and some of us are old enough to remember Roe v. Wade. Um, so that's Lewis Weber. We tend to treat American divisions over abortion and intertwined issues of reproductive technology, gender and sexual, uh, uh, sexuality, and bodily rights as fairly recent, really not much older than the Supreme Court's 1973 decision in Roe v. Wade. What I wanna talk about tonight is a much longer history of abortion, contraception, and beliefs about embryonic life and women's rights in the US. And tonight, I highlight two 20th century tools or platforms, as we would say, public media like film and private conversations like rap sessions, which is what they were called in the 1960s, to examine how women have been on the front lines of the conversation about their bodily rights for generations. So when you think about women's rights, you may know about Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton in the US and know how they agitated for women's right to vote from the 1840s forward. You may have recently been reminded of the centennial commemoration of women getting the vote in the US and the UK, and you're gonna have to wait another 20 years for the centennial celebration in France that, because they didn't get the vote until after World War II. The history of women's rights is popularly represented as the quest for political representation access to education, the right to join the professions, and so on. That's all true. But that's also the really safe, acceptable for high school AP history books version of women's rights. What is far less acknowledged, unless you've taken a class with one of our American historians at CMC, what is far less acknowledged is that an even longer history of women's rights, not just in the US, but elsewhere, has always been about women's quest to acquire their bodily authority and rights, their right as wives to say no to sex, that is to say that there is something called marital rape, their right as mothers to choose who will deliver their babies, their right as unmarried but pregnant women to give what was called their illegitimate or their bastard children legal status, their right to determine whether they will be pregnant or not. Their right as women of color to say no to sterilization. And for that matter, as women of color, their right to not have a body held in bondage. Their right to marry as freed women after slavery to marry at all and to marry the man they loved. And today, their right to parent as lesbians, queer, non-conforming, and trans individuals. The list of demands for bodily, private rights and autonomy could go on. These and other demands for bodily rights have always been dangerous. They don't always make it to the AP history books. And they have often been divisive, but not always. Tonight, I'll talk about many women along the way, including Lois Weber and Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood. Um, I'll probably have a few minutes to speak briefly about second wave feminists in the 1960s and 70s, and the Texas lawyer, Sarah Weddington, her, who pursued Jane Roe's case all the way to the Supreme Court in 1973. Lois Weber, Sarah Weddington, and these few brave 
women specifically opened conversations about abortion in a very public way, taking it from the shadows to the bright light of the courtroom and the law. One of the things I want to emphasize is shadows aren't always bad. That's not always a dark place. So keep that in mind. So before we go back in history to look at these movements, I want to talk about vocabulary and then take stock of where we are now, what Roe v. Wade provided and what Dobbs v. Jackson has changed. So a word about vocabulary, as I think probably everybody in this room knows, when talking about abortion, terminology matters and has politicized connotations. Fetus versus baby, pro-choice, pro-life, pregnant woman versus pregnant person, and the list could go on. Because I'm a historian, I often use words that people in the past used to talk about these matters. So I do tend to say pregnant women, and I sometimes say baby and unborn. So um, I do not mean to exclude those who would identify themselves as other than women, but as I say, I will be mostly talking about women because it's how they identify themselves and were seen at the time. So on the other hand, I generally use the word fetus to talk about a pregnancy from conception to birth, even though a reproductive biologist would only use the word fetus to speak of human pregnancy after 10 weeks. And I do like to move between different words because people have used different words. And sometimes using the word unborn makes us think differently about these stories. And so I um, do not intend to offend. I, only hope to sort of open how we think about all of these topics. So where are we legally? The Supreme Court's ruling in Roe v. Wade and a second very important decision the same day, Doe v. Bolton, were both issued just a little over 15 years ago exactly in January 1973. And in fact, Priya originally asked me to speak the next day and I was, I had no idea what would happen, whether there would be riots or what have you. And I said, why don't we wait a couple of weeks? So that's why I'm here now instead of actually closer to the anniversary. So in a nutshell, the rulings established that abortion was a constitutional right and the state could not ban abortion before fetal viability, so long as exceptions were made to protect the mother's health and life. The case of Doe v. Bolton helped expand what those definitions of health were. So those two rulings kind of pull and tug against each other. Roe was challenged and modified almost immediately. There have been scores of legal challenges and state laws that have limited what Roe and Doe provided. And people usually just speak of it as Roe, even though Doe has collapsed in that. So one of the most important of these limitations is the Hyde Amendment, which prohibits the use of federal funds for abortion which has created inequalities for low-income people who are disproportionately people of color. So in June of 2022, the court issued its ruling in Dobbs v. Jackson. And it, the opinion was written by Justice um, Samuel Alito. Um, this case uh, challenged the constitutionality of a 15-week ban on abortions in Missouri, so abortion after 15 weeks pregnancy. The court ruled 6-3 in favor of the ban, stating that there is no constitutional right to abortion. The court also ruled more narrowly with Chief Justice Roberts joining the minority to overturn Roe v. Wade. So that, I mean, what that means is Chief Justice Roberts did not vote to overturn, but it was overturned. Roe is gone, and the right to abortion is now left to each individual state. The upshot is that there are, as of today, I went and checked the maps, um, are 12 states um, in February 2023 that have full total bans on abortion. There are another two that have no abortion providers and thus cannot offer them. Most states on the map have at least some restrictions ranging from six weeks limits upwards and 12 states protect abortion rights. So 12 states protect and 12 completely ban. So let us go back to the last time in the US that say about one quarter of the US states banned abortion. Um, and this is trickier to figure out. I've been spending hours and hours trying to map an exact timeline out. 
but we could say this would be roughly around the 1850s or so. And so some of the states that had banned abortion, at least in part, were in Massachusetts, New York, and Connecticut, and a few other places, of course. Um, and most of these were partial limitations on abortion. But what I want us to think about is the states that did not have bans said nothing, nothing one way or another. They were silent on the matter. And that might be like, oh, okay, they never got around to it. Well, I wanna tell you why, and this is really important. There were no laws on the books because the common law, that is the Anglo-American legal tradition, said virtually nothing about abortion. When America declared its independence from Great Britain, this moment of the founding, Britain had no statute prohibiting or criminalizing abortion. In practice, abortion was and has been one of the tools of family planning in North America and the rest of the world. That is true at the founding. It is true in the Anglo-American tradition, France and all sorts of places. So early English colonists did not include abortion in their list of crimes. They didn't even add infanticide until the 1680s, and that was only because of new laws in England. It's not as if the Puritans closed their eyes to sex and sexual crimes, so maybe some of you read the Scarlet Letter in high school. Um, sodomy, bestiality, incest, fornication, and adultery were all identified, prosecuted, and culturally condemned among early English settlers. So it's strange for instance, that Connecticut magistrates executed not only a 13-year-old boy for bestiality, and I don't know if you're gonna wanna laugh or cry, but also the hen he copulated. Yet, they didn't bother hunting down pregnant women and practitioners who terminated pregnancies until another century when a woman died. The pressing reproductive concern, both in Europe and its colonies, was not abor abortion. Instead, the goal was to discipline sexual relations, not because sex was bad. So the Puritans actually were not hung up on sex. They actually liked sex, and they talked about it. Um, so it was because fatherless children were expensive, as were babies in already large, stretched thin families. That's the number one concern about sex in practical terms. The material issue was not the sanctity of life at conception, but the sanctity of the already living family. The paramount concern, like many places in the world today, was controlling the family's size in relation to its private resources. Each family's goal was to feed itself and not impose on the community or the state. So we think in the past there were various attempts at contraception. We know for sure, demographers know for sure that somehow the French, they're always so clever, the French had figured out how to control their fertility for centuries. But some of these things were a closely held secret. What we do know is that people throughout Europe, indigenous people in the Americas and in Africa did terminate their pregnancies and often because of economic reasons. So with the first colonists, um, women would sometimes talk with their husbands or partners about what they should do and we have evidence from letters and diaries of these kind of choices. Some consulted midwifery texts and recipe books that explained how to return the courses, that phrase, return the courses, that is how a woman could get her period back when it didn't arrive as it regularly did. So the first thing women tried to do was something physical or hot, like a bath, and they would ingest various herbs and metal compounds like iron filings. When that happened, the main concern for women was surviving the attempt at termination because ingesting plants like rue, juniper, tansy, and other substances could be toxic to mothers, not just to conceptions. So if these methods didn't result in what she and contemporaries considered the return of her period, she might turn to inserting substances and tools to dilate the cervix. African women used okra pods. Native American women used slippery elm bark. 
Both of these techniques were known by American colonists, including doctors. These, if these methods did not work, women moved on to sharper objects with the intention of rupturing the gestational or amniotic sac and inducing a miscarriage. So that all sounds pretty gruesome, and it often was. Termination early in pregnancy was so matter-of-factly addressed that even Benjamin Franklin provided information about inducing early-term miscarriages in his 1748 American instructor. And I think I might have a picture of it. Oh, I've got our justices. So here are some of, so what I had here are some of these advertisements uh, from the 19th century, genuine female monthly pills, some different kind of compounds you can purchase. And this is the American instructor that has instructions. So it's a copy from the English book. And Franklin added several um, details about American diseases, um, for instance, yellow fever, and what some of the, the cures could be, some of the prophylactics. Um, and he added the problem of women having suppressed courses of their periods being too light. That's not in the original English version. He adds it. So he explains that this was, quote, a common complaint among unmarried women, end quote, and he suggested jokingly that women should avoid pretty fellows if they don't want to get pregnant. But he suggested if they are pregnant, um, they should exercise vigorously and drink teas with pennyroyal, which was one of the best known abortifacients of the age. So abortion has been practiced across the globe for millennia, and it does not seem to have generated much popular concern or worry for a very long time. In English and European texts, medical, personal, and legal, the practical dividing line was that along the line of quickening, which divided something, an act that was about personal health care, to an act that some jurists called homicide, that some people felt was criminal and wrong. But that moment of quickening was a determination, and it was up to the mother herself. No one else could tell a woman when a baby kicks. And believe me, when it kicks, you, you, you know. And it happens at different times. So on my third baby, who is very active and never goes to sleep in real life now as an 18-year-old, he started quicking, you know, quickening and kicking like a little maniac by about 13 or 14 weeks. But with my first son, who's um, really chill, he didn't um, start kicking until about 22 or 23 weeks. And then um, my middle one was somewhere in between. And it's like a middle kid, of course, you know, he's somewhere <laughs> in between. So the idea with quickening is first that that's up to the mother to determine. Um, and it was also closely correlated with what was in religious traditions and, and, and popular culture, that until that point, the embryo did not have a soul. It did not yet have that thing that made it human. And we, we can talk more about you know, some of the Judeo-Christian um, and Islamic definitions of when ensoulment and animation and all of that happens. But what this came down to is a mother could tell you when the bump became a baby. So words like sin, wrong, and crime were rarely used. Attempts at contraception, abortion, and family limitation were private decisions. Neither the church nor the state often stepped in. What happened in individual women's pregnancy was just not the business of early modern magistrates or magistrates really very often in the early Americas. There was virtually no conversation about the rights of the fetus. In fact, there really isn't. There's like, a, there's kind of complex stuff about property, but fetuses do not have legal standing in English common law. And there's very little about the wrongs of women inducing the return of their periods. It is only after quickening that those, those kind of questions change. And it is only in the 19th century that people start to look at this differently. So the first modern laws again in the West that were 
specifically against ab abortion were those that the French passed in 1791, so that's early in the French Revolution, and in 1810 when Napoleon's kind of all excited about being the big boss. Um, and Lord Ellenborough pushed through the first British Act defining the willful termination of pregnancy as criminal in 1803. And here he said it was a misdemeanor before quickening, a felony after. And that, that kind of division starts, starts to follow throughout the 19th century. So one of our questions might be why Napoleon and Ellenborough cared at this exact moment. Why now? Why not 10 years earlier? Why not 10 years later? So the answer probably has to do with the fact that they were both locked in war with each other and would be for nearly 25 years straight. Both France and Britain needed soldiers and sailors, a growing population. Their laws against abortion at the turn of the 19th century clustered with other nation building measures, actually. I mean, they're part of the, you know, the, the same bills. So in the new United States, there, wa there were no laws against abortion, but this changed in 1821. There's a seduction case in um, Connecticut. So this scoundrel itinerant Episcopal priest, Ami Rogers, seduced a woman, she got pregnant, he gave her some abortifacients, they didn't work, and then he attempted to perform an abortion on her with surgical instruments. It killed the fetus, it was fairly late in the pregnancy and it caused Asana Smith great damage. So she delivered a, de a dead baby and almost died. In this case, it was her family that decided to pursue him, not because of the abortion, but because he had destroyed her reputation and her health. Because there was no law against abortion, the best the Connecticut court could do was charge him with sexual assault. So the jury convicted him for two years in prison, and then legislatures got, legislators got to work. There was widespread outrage about his cruel behavior. And I think I might have a picture of, no, I don't. I thought I had a picture of, I, sorry, I don't have a picture of him. Uh, so the outrage led to the first U.S. statute criminalizing abortion in 1821 in Connecticut. So this symbolized an emergent anxiety in American culture that sort of shifted the conversation about sexuality and sexual relations. In the 19th century, and this is especially true in Britain and the United States, there's kind of a story of lustful, villainous men who take advantage of innocent women, abandon them, and lead them to the desperate measures of abortion. And this became a kind of popular topic in newspapers. It became a way of talking about sex at the same time that the British and Americans were becoming more buttoned up and a little less open about talking about sexuality and ge in general. So while this is happening, the American population grew by leaps and bounds, which meant that the medical marketplace was competitive and combative. So many male practitioners wanted to knock out midwives and herbalists, and one tactic was to portray them as illicit and unprincipled. So uh, abortion was tacit and widespread, uh, tacitly accepted and widespread, but the early 19th century American press uh, played up these negative features and doctors started to capitalize on this. And this is when the abortion wars really began. This is when the division really starts in the United States. The most successful campaigner was Horatio Robinson Storr, MD, who single-handedly led a crusade to eradicate abortion among Americans in the 1860s. So he was professionally motivated. He wanted to knock out competition and he wanted to protect the professional authority of his friends and allies. He and his band of medical brothers were male wasps, mostly from New England and defenders of white Protestant families against the incursions of the Irish and other immigrants. They were the founders of the American Medical Association, the body that effectively squashed competing professional organizations and medical models for the last 100 years, and also the body that effectively squashed midwifery legally in the 20th century in the United States. So Storer was obsessed with abortion, and he got the AMA to pay for the distribution of tens of thousands of these anti-abortion pamphlets. Why not? 
these were given to female patients. So he beat the nativist drum, lamenting the high birth rates of immigrant populations, especially Irish Catholics in his hometown, Boston. He was outraged that middle class and elite Protestant women were controlling their fertility and family size with illicit birth control and also abortions, which many doctors were performing. But what Storr also really did is he changed the way that people thought about abortion and how they thought about quickening, for instance, and that dividing line and about abortion as a form of healthcare. Whether you like it or not, this is how people thought about it initially in that first 10, 15, 20 weeks. So he was the first widely known American to insist that life began at conception. He had no medical or scientific evidence to make those claims, and he's known by medical historians and feminists for very, very sloppy misquotes and mangling statistics and all sorts of things like that. But many of his claims have survived. Um, for instance, that you can hear the heartbeat at six weeks. That's not true. It's, I mean, it is tissue that will become a heart if the pregnancy continues, but it is, it is simply the beating of very early embryonic cells. Um, so it was not just his description of a blastocyst bursting with life that was, that was powerful. It was his warning and claims to pregnant women about their bodies and minds. He told them that abortion increased their chances of infertility, cancer, insanity, and premature death it would dry them up, it would wreck their souls. It was more dangerous than childbirth, which may have been true in some cases in the 19th century, certainly a surgical abortion was not true after the 1940s. Abortions made women feel guilty and were spiritual crimes. They could never be forgiven. Abortions cheated husbands, families, and the nation, and this, after the devastation of the US Civil War. So in other words, what Storr did was create a maternal consciousness in women that had not existed before in American culture. And we can't overestimate the power of every woman who went to a middle class or elite AMA physician being handed one of these pamphlets for decades. And these influenced family magazines, it influenced advertising, these new models of maternity and and a darling baby in pregnancy were absolutely everywhere. This was buttressed further at about the same time by Pope Pius's statement that life began at conception in 1869. There's um, a little six year period in the papacy in the 16th century where two popes go back and forth about when conception or when life begins. So one pope says initially, it starts at conception. Six years later, the other pope says, no, we're not so sure about that. So there had always been debate among theologians and moralists about when life began. But for all practical purposes and for Catholic purposes, it was not until 1869. So one of the other things that happened in the same period is um, a campaign against obscenity and smut. So these various anti-vice activ activists in Britain and the United States decided that we can't have obscenity distributed. So Anthony Comstock is the most famous example here in the United States, and his law was passed at the federal level in 1873. So it was aimed at any material considered lewd or indecent, including information about human sexuality and reproduction. So not just you know pornography. So by 1900, girls and women were legally kept from reading about their own physiology and human reproduction. So it made it a crime to distribute contraception itself and also a crime to cross state lines and in some states to talk about contraception at all. So um, this did not stop people from having abortions in the 19th century. Storer's campaign did not work. Pope Pius's statement about the beginning of life did not work. And Comstock did not work. So the estimates on the number of abortions in the 19th century among American women, among middle class women, are run from anywhere from one sixth to one third of pregnancies each year were terminated intentionally. 
And that, that's a number that's you know, similar to, to modern numbers. And if, I mean, if there's nothing else that I would want you to take away is that criminalization doesn't stop the practice. Whether you're for or against abortion, criminalization doesn't stop the practice. And so these campaigns drove abortion really underground. So if the shadows in the 18th century were the kind of private conversations between midwives and women, between husbands and wives about what they wanted to do, by the second half of the 19th century, the shadows are these backroom alleys. Um, with, uh, you know, with backroom abortions, um, women self-inducing in all of these very sad and tragic stories. By 1900, it's clear there were two medical systems, two worlds of reproductive knowledge and choice divided by economics. So middle class and elite women not only practiced abortion, they also knew about contraception and they had the means to have their physicians in unmarked boxes get cervical caps and other devices from Holland and France where it was legal. But that's not what happened for most, most women in the United States in this period. So during the progressive movement, women knew this was one of the places they needed to act. And Margaret Sanger, who, who's a controversial um, figure, oh, that's Anthony Comstock, um, chasing down vice. So he liked to like look at the vice that he was opposed to. So um, this is Margaret Sanger as a nurse, and this is her, her clinic that doesn't last very long with the mothers with their children outside who have come for contraception. She is absolutely for contraception, not for abortion. And the story she tells when she realized that contraception was the single most important thing that she could do for women was this story of Sadie Sachs, and we don't know if Sadie Sachs was a, you know, a kind of um, composite character or um, a real person. She doesn't, I haven't found her in the census, and I know other historians haven't either. So in July of 1912, when she was a nurse, she was um, called to an apartment on the Lower East Side to Sadie Sachs, a 20-something mother with a raging septic infection from a self-induced abortion. This is July. Sadie and her truck driving husband, Jake, already had three children, but they kept getting pregnant. Sadie begged the doctor to tell her how to avoid all of these pregnancies and the consequent danger of abortions. The doctor said, tell Jake to sleep on the roof. But the story got worse. Three months later, Jake Sachs called her back to their Grand Street flat. Sadie was feverish and delirious again. When Margaret arrived, it was too late. When the doctors came, it was too late. There was nothing they could do. It was too late for antiseptics to staunch the infection and the running blood in her genital tract. Sadie died in agony from septicemia caused by another self-induced abortion. And you know, there's debate about how old she is, if she's a real person or not, but probably about 25, 26, left a husband with three children. So, Margaret Sanger said at that moment that she knew she was called not only to save women and children, but to save all of humanity. Her message was inspiring, and it inspired Lois Weber, our filmmaker that I began with. One of the problems that Margaret Sanger faced, so this is a picture of a tenement. I, don't, I mean, it's not, I mean, it's kind of grainy. It shows you like how glum and dirty and difficult the situation was. So one of the things Margaret Sanger had found is that she was constantly getting censored. So she wanted to have a column called What Every Girl Should Know in the New York Call. Um, the editors asked her to do it. And this is what the pamphlet looks like when she eventually published it. But when she tried to publish it in the newspaper, Anthony Comstock said no, and so the call printed it as what every girl should know. Nothing. And this is the problem for activists. If you can't publish, if you can't send things through the mail, in some states, if you can't even hand out handbills and you can't hand out contraception, what do you do? So film was a new opportunity. It operated sort of um, in terms of surveillance and control in a different way than uh, books and pamphlets did in this period. So, and, so film is kind of, there are debates 
about when it's exactly invented, but let's say 1895. Um, and there are not regulatory bodies over film in the United States until 1907. So that allows some level of freedom. And by chance, it's also a, a form of medium that women are very involved in. So there's a disproportionate number of women directors and writers. And Lois Weber is really considered the greatest of these early filmmakers. She was considered better than, than, um, than Griffith, who you know, became notorious for birth of, a, birth of a Nation. She was a beautiful and skilled cinematographer. She brought situations to life. Her goal was to show people difficult situations and not entertain them, not end up with schmaltzy, corny stories, but to get them to change their mind. And that was something that someone like Margaret Sanger couldn't quite do in print easily because Anthony Comstock kept stealing all of her pamphlets and sending all of the birth control reformers to jail. So Where Are My Children is one of about a dozen of these films that engages these issues. And it's, it's a strange film. Um, it's strange in part because by the time it comes out in 1916, there is a little bit of censorship. And from state to state, there are different censoring bodies. And so the film that would have been shown in each state or each city was slightly different. And it's one of the many lost films. So the vast majority of silent films are lost. They do not exist. And that's because of the fragility of celluloid and all of that. People have been able to, film scholars have been able to patch together this film. We're pretty sure that it's not the full and total story. There's some weird bumps in the plot line. But the plot line is kind of a, a double story. So one is where a doctor named, um, uh, uh, oops, I jumped ahead, uh, where a doctor is um, tried for distributing birth control information to his patients. And Richard Walton, the, the district attorney there, is forced, because it's against the law, he's forced to bring him to trial. Now, Richard Walton is in favor of birth control, but this is what the law demands. And so the doctor explains all of the reasons he distributes birth control. And every single case is an example of tragedy. So one is a single woman who's um, abused and abandoned, and she's pregnant, and she jumps off a bridge. If she had had contraception, things would have been different. And so it goes with all these, these different stories. So that's all well and good. But what becomes kind of confusing about the story is that there's also this story about seduction going on. And it turns out that the person who explains to the other women how you get an abortion is Richard Walton's wife. So she is kind of the villain in the sur surviving version we have. So this film infuriated Margaret Sanger, and she decided she would make her own film to set the record straight. Now, it's a lost film. It was very quickly and heavily censored, so we don't know what all was there. We do know from Margaret Sanger's personality, it was probably very melodramatic. She was certainly the hero. She was starring in it and all of that. It was her story of, of Sadie Sachs and these other things. She showed it a couple times, and um, the power of the Catholic Church in New York shut, shut it down. And so you know, the couple copies that existed, they were seized, they are gone. We do not know. But the goal with these various films was to try to help women understand that there was an alternative to abortion. So to be clear with these, with these um, progressive reformers, they were not really in favor of abortion, although they could find understandable reasons why women had chosen that. What they wanted to do was provide contraception. They had the hope that if all women had access to contraception, they wouldn't have to have abortions. So it's not quite what ends up happening in reality when contraception improves in the 20th century, when, for instance, the hormonal pill comes into being, when the AMA lifts its prohibition against contraception in 1937, and so forth. 
women still continue to have abortions at huge numbers in the 1930s in the Depression. After World War II, doctors really, the AMA really takes control of childbirth, of birth control. It's very difficult to get birth control except at um, the few Planned Parenthoods and from, from your AMA doctor. There's a women's health movement that begins in the 1950s and 60s that really resists this. So childbirth is more medicalized in the US than anywhere else in, in the world. And so a number of women come together in what we might call rap sessions. There's a set of healthcare movements. This is a woman named Pat McGinnis who headed up a, a group called the Society for Humane Abortion in the 1960s. And of course, the Comstock laws are still in force and there's still states where contraception itself was illegal. So what she did is she'd get on the radio. You can hear her interviews and her conversations on Pacifica Radio throughout the 1960s. It's on the, um, what, uh, not the Wayback Machine, what is it, the Internet Archives. And they're really moving. I mean, that, I mean, it's just hours and hours of these interviews that she's out there telling women, you can take control of your body if only we would be able to change the law. So there are several of these movements. You might know Our Bodies Ourselves, for instance, a number of them. Down in Texas, in Austin, Texas, there's a, there's a, a student radical magazine called The Rag, and it uh, was opposed to the Vietnam War, opposed to um, you know, all, all sorts of things about um, US foreign policy, um, capitalism, uh, it was for free speech, for women's rights, all of these things. It was for women's rights. One of the key people on the rag was Sarah Weddington, who becomes the attorney in Roe v. Wade. And this is where she got her start. And it's what she talks about in her autobiography, A Matter of Choice. So she had an illegal abortion in 1967. She had to go to Mexico with her fiance. They did not have the money to support a child. They wanted to have one as early as possible. So they go to Mexico. It, she was fine. It, she healed, but she was completely traumatized. She decided other women should not go through this. And so what she and other women on the rag did, that doesn't sound very nice, um, <laughs> what, um, the women who worked for the RAG, and this is also true of Berkeley papers, Boston papers, all of these kind of zines, they started to give a little teeny bit of information about how women could get contraception where it was illegal and how they might be able to find a practitioner who was sympathetic or how they could cross state lines. So by this point, before 1973, there are a few states, California, and New York where abortion had been legalized. But she decides it's more than this. And so after she graduates from, from UT Austin Law School, she and her colleagues and friends and her husband and her law professors want to challenge the Texas law that prohibits abortion. And they know that it's not gonna happen through the legislature in the way that it had in California. So, this is you know, kind of a legal rap session. She hangs out with her law school professors and she can't really get a job because um, she's a woman. And so she does research for her professors and they're very sympathetic to this, by and large, not all of them. And they work and they, you know, and the, the, the members of the RAG and everything, they really try to think, what can we do? And they brainstorm and they come up with this idea that they can call upon a federal panel to hear a case that they can challenge the state law and that's that's what they do and it's kind of through this rap session format and it's through the rap session format that she's able to find the woman who will end up being jane roe the plaintiff the the party was standing in the case and, um, you know, uh, the rest is partly history. You know it. It goes up to the court, and the court finds. Um, this is Sarah Weddington, um, I presume in the library, working on her case. Um, uh, it goes up to the courts, and the court decides 
that women do have the right to abortion on the grounds of privacy. And so one of the clips I was going to show you is that, um, and I'm not, because we're short on time, is um, by the time Sarah Weddington makes this, this argument and goes up to the court, this world of rap sessions and popular culture had really changed how people were thinking about abortion. American families were getting smaller. There was a large movement that families should only have two kids. So it's part of this thing called the zero population growth movement, which I had never heard of until I came to CMC in 1996. And the person who told me about it was the late Professor Ward Elliott. And it was a movement um, about uh, uh, global overpopulation. So there, there were these kind of political reasons why people were rethinking how many kids a family should have. And this had really seeped into popular culture. This is the TV show Maud, which was a little bit radical for the day. And this um, episode, it's a two-part episode, it's called Maud's Abortion. And she's in her 40s, she um, finds herself, late 40s, finds herself pregnant. She thinks her husband Walter wants her to have the kid. They go back and forth, back and forth. Finally, they admit late, at night in bed that they do not want to have a child at 47. And Walter says to her, Maud, it's your decision. This is a private decision for a woman to make. And that's, that's where people are in the 1970s. They believe it culturally, even before the court decides. This is 72. This is before the court decided in 73. So I'm gonna end there since I know we started a little late, but I don't wanna go over and I wanna leave room for questions or comments or protests. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Cody, for the really interesting talk. Now she'll be taking questions, so if you have a question, please line up at one of these two microphones and introduce yourself. Say your name, your year, your school. Thank you. It's okay, we can go home now. Okay. We don't, I mean, whatever. Oh, gosh. Hi, uh, I'm Rowan. I'm a first year at CMC. Hi. Uh, thank you for the talk. It was great, I learned a lot. Um, I wanted to ask you about Margaret Sanger because, you know, the like, the controversy you, you were yeah. referencing was that yeah. she, I assume it was that she was like a eugenicist and a white supremacist. And so I'm like, I'm wondering what yeah. you think. I wonder if you, if you could talk about in general, like the influence of eugenicism and of white supremacy yeah. on like the whole, like in fe on the feminist movements in generally, um, and I guess on this issue specifically. It's such an important question. And it's a really important question in American history in particular. So yes, I mean, it's, it's unquestioned that Margaret Sanger is associated with a eugenics movement. I think part of the challenge is eugenics could mean many, many things. And in its worst forms, it was really a kind of grotesque, violent form of controlling people of different races or different mental abilities. Um, you know, there are terrible court cases that, that bring this to light. Um, she didn't speak out. I mean, I think Planned Parenthood's take on this, they, ha they have a, a, an apology on their website right now about her. She did not speak out against the colleagues who were more vocal eugenicists. But some of the misunderstanding is, um, she has a book, for instance, it's called A New Race, and people assume when she says race, she means white people, she doesn't. When people talked about race in this period, they also meant species. And so she, her, and you know, I don't want to overly defend her, because she's, she's also a really, I've been writing a lot about her lately. I mean, she's a, she's a difficult person. Um, but her goal was to give all women the right to decide whether they wanted to be pregnant or not. And she does not speak specifically about differences in race in particular. But she is problematic because she belongs to this, this generation. And it's a problem in these birth control films. They often justify abortion on eugenic grounds rather than other ones. So thank you for asking that sticky question, which I knew someone would ask. 
<laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Hi, Professor Cody. Um, I'm curious as to what the role, how the role of the AMA has changed in the conversation about abortion and what their stance is today. Oh, that's great. Thank you, Olivia. Um, yeah, so the AMA actually, um, by the 1960s, completely changed course. So by 1967, they support some liberalization of abortion, as, as does ACOG, the American College of um, Obstetricians and Gynecologists, several legal organizations, the different population groups. Planned Parenthood actually was reluctant. Margaret Sanger was always opposed to abortion, and Planned Parenthood had never performed abortions in her life or before Roe v. Wade. So the AMA actually ended up kind of liberalizing more on abortion earlier than, say, Margaret Sanger, who died like in the, the late 1960s. Um, the, yeah, I mean, the AMA has become more, I would say, liberal and supportive. I'm not a, a doctor. I know, some, I know some of my students have parents who, uh, are, are students whose parents are doctors, and so they may be able to say a little bit more more there, but they, they did change course. Thank you. Thanks, Olivia. Hi, Professor Cody. Hello, Mina. Um, I was wondering, because you mentioned a lot about the Comstock laws, was the Hayes Code also influential in terms of what could be yeah. talked about abortion uh, yes. in film? Yes, and um, as I realized uh, I was completely running out of time, I completely cut that portion of the conversation. So, in fact, what happens. So, so um, Mina is referring to a code in the early 1930s where Hollywood self-censored itself. So in addition to these different state and sometimes city regulatory body, um, bodies, Hollywood decided let's not, you know, talk about these controversial topics like contraception or abortion. So there, there's kind of this brief moment in the silent era where these conversations happen. Interestingly, the conversation gets picked up in Europe um, where there aren't the same restrictions. So sometimes Americans are able to see German and Scandinavian and then British films that talk about these things, but the censors in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s sometimes won't let in Danish films, you know, and they like treat it like it's pornography, but sometimes, and I'm sure sometimes it was, because I think the Danes are known for that. But, <laughs> But, um, but a lot of times it would just be, you know, a sad story, not dissimilar to the seduced maiden story in Lois Weber's pieces. So the, you know, kind of the sad, really horrible twist to all of this is as the Hayes Codes came in and prohibited filmmakers from explicitly addressing these sexual topics. So again, just a small window when film can do this in the American case, like when Lois Weber is working. When they prohibit these topics, it's also when they start to make actresses, female actors, sign no pregnancy clauses, no marriage clauses. And what we now know in the last 10 and 20 years, there are a very large number of actresses who had to have abortions to continue working. So it's a terrible and I think evil paradox that the very same men who supported the, the Hayes Code and like, you know, would have Busby Berkeley like things going on at the same time expected their starlets to always look like they were 19 year old unmarried young women. Um, yeah, so thanks Mina. Hello, um, my name is Marcel. I'm a senior at Pitzer, and thank you so much for your talk. I was hoping to ask about the earlier part when you were mentioning how basically abortion was legally a non-issue in early modern Europe, and similarly how you know the Puritans had did not have too many qualms about sex. But I was just wondering about the sort of social and cultural acceptability of abortion. Yeah. For instance, whether uh, these like methods of inducing termination that you mentioned had to be disseminated secretively or whether it was yeah. um, you know pretty common and acceptable thank you thank you Marcel it's nice to see you again so um, it's a, a terrific question 
So we mostly guess that most women would know about these things um, through word of mouth orally, um, particularly the further back you go or when you go to European countries where the literacy rate is not so high. But you can find in pretty much any midwifery text or kind of marriage manual, which is the early modern version of a, a sex guide or books that might talk about what to expect in pregnancy, there's always something that talks about, you know, what we would say in, oops, what we would say in our world, if your period is late, you know, if, you, if your um, courses are suppressed, this is what you do. So that was, that was present. Um, it's, it's a weird thing because it's not like anybody's on the barricade saying like, we think abortion is good, but we know that people are doing it. Um, and there's no protection of fetal life in the law um, until much later. But it is kind of an absence that people don't talk about it and defend it positively. So yeah, so, so it's, a, it's a tough question to answer. I don't know if I answered it. Hi. Hi, Mimi. Thank My you name's so Mimi. Um, I graduated uh, from CMC in 2021. And oh my gosh, your talk. I wish I was back in school. Um, but anyway, my question for you is, why do you personally um, believe that men in power feel so entitled to uh, women's bodies? Um, well, thank you, Mimi. And Mimi, thank you from um, driving probably clear across LA. And I don't know if it's even like on the, the um, what were we on, on Twitter? Or no, what were we on? Email? Instagram. Oh. <laughs> it, so I don't know if they're Instagram archives, but me oh, yes. interviewed me for Women's History Day um, her senior year. And so we had this great conversation. So it's really nice um, to see you again. So I would actually, um, respond kind of cheekily, which is I'm not always sure that men do want to control women's bodies in this debate. I mean, certainly Horatio Storr, Napoleon, and Lord Ellenborough. So you've got three big guys there who do. And they're powerful, and they, they are very effective that way. But on the other hand, there are male feminists who support these, these issues. So someone like John Stuart Mills, who I don't know if he defended abortion in particular, but is somebody who's very concerned about the issue of marital rape, for instance, and very explicitly concerned about that. And so, um, you know, and William Sanger, Margaret's husband, is one who went to jail. Um, she went to jail intentionally. So she had the 500, like on another case, she had the $500 to pay it when they took her away in a paddy wagon, but she knew that she would get a lot more publicity if she could say, I was in the jail with the rats and the mold and everything, and then she paid it the next day. But <laughs> William, William, her husband, Bill Sanger, actually went for a whole month, and Comstock was the person who brought him on charges. She was off in Europe um, taking a new lover um, <laughs> when, <laughs> when he was, uh, charged and he knew that and so he was writing her love letters like please come back margaret can't we mend things and he was taking care of the kids um and then um, so comstock tries him and um it was just a kangaroo court and um he says i am guilty i am guilty but it is the law that is on trial not i and so he is somebody you know as a man you know a heterosexual cis male who very much cares about these issues and is willing to stick his neck out and i would and i would say um you know if i had eight hours to talk the twist after roe v wade is that um the folks really on the front lines um against abortion access include women so Phyllis Schlafly, Anita Bryant, and um, you know, it's, I, I mean, we live in a pluralistic democracy, which is fantastic that we have many views um, and many personal feelings and beliefs about this. So I'm all for that. Um, but it is also women who sometimes would say no to abortion. 
but yeah, Horatio, he was just a jerk. <laughs> so. Hello, Professor Lisa. Um, <laughs> Hello, Professor So Jonathan. I'm gonna ask a controversial question. Oh, no. With the overturning of Roe v. Wade, I have the sense that the justices misled the public. In the confirmation hearings, almost every justice who voted against Roe v. Wade had said it was settled law. And I think there was the expectation that they would not overturn Roe v. Wade. Yeah. And so I personally feel misled, betrayed. Yeah. Um, is there a history, a deeper history, of restricting access to abortion and preventing women from having control of the body and people who are making these decisions um, sort of you know, misrepresenting their positions in this way? Or yeah. is there a historical background to this Supreme Court decision that caught many of yeah. us by surprise? Yeah, um, you and Susan Collins feel <laughs> misled, <laughs> right? I mean, she, she right? So, yeah. um, or I guess that was with um, Kavanaugh, right? Yeah, so that, yeah, she, was, she felt misled with him. So, um, yeah, in terms of misrepresenting, I mean, Storer her, himself is someone. So when he, you know, he claimed certain numbers about abortion rates, live birth rates, about, different numbers of how many Catholics were born versus you know, the excellent Protestants. I mean, he kind of plays funny with all that. By the way, he ends up converting to Catholicism later, later on. Um, so I mean, I think there was some sort of sincerity to his belief if he converted. But yeah, I mean, that, that, is, that is typical. In terms of um, how the justices do, do it, how they can justify it and say they did not mislead us. I'm gonna to turn to a really technical legal issue. And this is something that um, Justice Scalia and um, Justice Coney Barrett care very, very much about is um, following plain words rather than the penumbra which is, so, so that, that's all abstract. Penumbra is stuff out there. Um, so penumbra is the things we can presume are the rights inherent in the Constitution or a tax. Like, of course, like the Constitution doesn't say we can all get married, right? It, there's no, it doesn't say that, you know, in, in the Bill of Rights. But we can assume, because of human history, that that's there. And so, and that's a little bit of how the right to privacy is, is, is leaned on, or is, is used, um, that it's in the penumbra. Um, and so Scalia and Barrett don't like that. They want to read the text in plain terms. And so um, Barrett talks about the distinction between equity and law. So law is the rule. So like in the case of Lois Weber's district attorney who has to take the doctor to court because he's distributing contraception knowledge, he doesn't want to, but he has to because that's what the law says. In English legal tradition, there's this other court, the Court of Equity. And the Court of Equity is designed to balance and to create a kind of fairness when the common law can't provide a provision. And equity is used a lot in the English case and it's totally the most interesting of the courts in terms of the records and the, the things that, that, that um, we all find in it. I actually am a British historian, so that's where I do my research mostly. Um, but I say all of this because Barrett says, when you weigh any of these things, it's a matter of the law versus equity. And if you lean too much towards equity, what would seem fair that we've done something for 49 years and it will burden people in the United States to suddenly not have access to ab abortion. She describes that explicitly. I listened to one of her Notre Dame talks about this. She explicitly describes that as an, a, a, an overreach of equity, so, right? Of like being too sympathetic, too kind. So I actually think because she would lean on the equity law business, I think she'd say like, no, I'm following the law and I read the plain text. So um, I sympathize, but I don't think she would. <laughs> no, and she's, I mean, she's very smart. I mean, it's really, I mean, the stuff she does is really interesting, but it lands in a different place. Hi, I'm Tess. I'm Hi, a Tess. Scripps first year, and I'm also from Austin, Texas. Um, Woo! 
But my question to you is from like a historical perspective, yeah. how do you suggest that we bring abortion back into the private sphere and out of the public sphere? Do you have any like mobilization ideas or like strategies that you think would be good to make it private again? What a, a, an inventive question. Um, it, it's, it's a wonderful question. Um, I think that the you know the women's health care movement in the 50s and 60s in some way you know it's a response to not having any other space where women can talk about you know learning about their bodies about contraception abortion but it is necessarily a private space because it has to be a safe space where you trust the other people you're talking to and if in a state like connecticut you're passing around diaphragms or something, you have to trust those, those people. So those, those kind of scenarios are certainly the situations that were private, were designed to be private, and designed to mobilize through those, those pathways. But for our age now, when nobody is private at all, I don't know. I mean, it's a really good, I mean, it's a great question. Do, do you have ideas? <laughs> <laughs> I thought a lot about it, but no, hence why. Uh, yeah. I don't know. We, I mean, we can work on it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Tess. Well, thank you so much. Oh, I thanks. It. Thanks. All the time that we have for questions tonight, but thank you again, Professor Cody, and thank you all for your amazing questions. Oh, thank you. Thank you.